Uh, so it is my pleasure to introduce Lacia Vicent. She is a incoming fellow at the Center for Law and Business at the University of California, Berkeley School of Law. She is also a visiting professor of law at the University of Camerino in Italy, where she teaches a series of seminars on sustainable development and corporate governance. Prior to that, she was a consultant in the United Nations system, assistant professor of law at the Louisiana State University Paul M. Hubert Law Center, and a lecturer at the University of Illinois uh, Geese College of Business. Professor Descent is an Anglo-Portuguese with a PhD from European University Institute. She uses a global and comparative approach to the study of business law, and that is what she's going to be talking about today, specifically with respect to concealment clauses in the United States. So she's going to be giving a presentation, and there should be some time at the end for questions, so, so please uh, you know, follow along and think about any questions you might have at the end. Um, but without further ado, um, Lacia, I'll let you go ahead and get started. Hello, hello everyone. Um, uh, thank you, Camden, for that generous introduction. Um, I heard uh, that uh, you were having a pizza party today, so I decided to bring my own pizza as well. Um, so I hope that you can hear me well. If you cannot, please let me know uh, in the chat so that I can make proper arrangements and we can continue our conversation. So today I am presenting my latest article, State Competition and Knowledge Spillover, What is There in a Market? In this article, I, I compare two very different market structures, the US market and the European Union market. I hope that you can take from this presentation useful insights that will help you further your knowledge, consider certain policy issues that resonate with the Canadian market, economy, and society, and be creative. At the end of the presentation, please do not hesitate to ask me questions or make comments, which I promise I will cherish and use to improve the draft that I am about to submit to a journal. My paper is framed within an evolutionary dynamic. It is all about the mechanisms that will help the law regenerate itself for the betterment of institutions. Specifically, I think about the connection between a competition and the role of law for economic and societal development. For example, if there is enough market competition, does that mean that we do not need law to develop institutions and organizations? Or if there is law, does that mean that the law will tend to facilitate organizational development and therefore market competition is no longer needed for innovation? When legislatures impose market restrictions that prevent certain market participants from having access to the market, do we need to reverse course and claim a blank check for competition? For example, you, you may have heard that in January 2023, the Federal Trade Commission in the United States, also known as FTC, proposed um, the non-compete clause rule, which would ban all non-competes in the U.S., as it read in the proposal, the proposed rule would, among other things, provide that it is uh, an unfair method of competition for an employer to enter into or attempt to enter into a non-compete clause with a worker, to maintain with a worker a non-compete clause, or under certain circumstances to represent to a worker that the worker is subject to a non-compete clause. 
Prior to this proposal, there were reports of abuses perpetrated by technology companies that used similar uh, restrictive clauses, namely non-disclosure agreements or NDAs and other concealment clauses in employment contracts. For example, in 2021, the Financial Times reported that investors challenged NDAs and concealment clauses at large technology groups. The Financial Times reported that seven of the largest U.S. technology companies, including Alphabet, Amazon, and Meta, were facing investor pressure to publish more information about their non-disclosure agreements and other concealment clauses in employment contracts. So given these examples, I essentially want to understand what the role of the law is and what is the role of markets in creating better policies for all of us, policies that ensure that we all enjoy economic freedoms, such as freedom of movement and establishment and generate economic and societal development. That's what motivated me to write this paper. Um, so the main contributions um, of the paper, um, this paper contributes um, in several ways. Um, it talks about non-disclosure agreements, NDAs, and explains how um, and explains how they are handled and why they are handled the way they are handled. It suggests new models for state competition or jurisdictional competition as a source of new policies that matter for businesses and societies. But uh, I have two main contributions of this paper. The first main contribution is the proposal of an integrative market as a catalyzer of openness economic freedoms and non-discrimination when there is not enough market access and competition. The second main contribution this paper makes is the idea of a network for a corporate governance when the law is insufficient to stimulate competition and create a more integrated market. Because of the 2021 Financial Times report about investors that challenged NDAs and concealment clauses at large technology groups, I used those non-disclosure agreements as examples of market restrictions around which we can find normative solutions to this broader inquiry concerning the roles of the law and markets in fostering access, integration, and development. Also, the issue of market access and uh, market freedoms matter because investors' demands for changes about disclosure of concealment clauses that coat toxic work environments inside organizations may, may gain traction due to institutional investors and labor unions involvement, pressure from social movements like the Me Too movement, phenomena like the great resignation following the COVID-19 pandemic. As you can see, based on our lived experiences for the last few years, these movements have global influence. My article suggests that work developed by lawyers, notaries, accountants, and other gatekeepers at the market level will provide new legal grounds within which the relationships between shareholders, managers, employees, customers, and other corporate constituencies can be rearranged, especially when it comes to managing risks in complex corporate structures. But is the work that all of these actors can develop on the market from the bottom up enough to prevent the effects of pervasive contractual practices that restrict market access like NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, and non-concealment clauses? 
It is not. Especially because when we are talking about contractual practices, even if in the context of corporations, we are still in the realm of the principle of contractual freedom. Thus, we need policy mechanisms that will have a more systemic effect that will determine the change of corporate policies where that change is needed to leave no one behind. So let's go to my uh, research question that has been popping up. Uh, it's time to talk about it. Um, and so um, this article's theoretical uh, approach is based uh, on the following research, uh, on the following research question. How can state competition create new enforceable legal solutions for the high transaction costs deriving from the contractual governance of corporations and the management of other interests besides shareholders' interests? These questions uh, about state competition make sense in the context of the United States which is a federation of states, and the European Union, which is composed of several member states. Why am I making a normative proposal um, of state competition for policy outcomes, you may ask? In the words of Hans Miklitz, a German professor of EU economic law, the last 30 years have left us with deep insights on regulatory competition in companies for states to attract businesses to favorable environments and on the network effects of a highly specialized community of companies, shareholders, lawyers, and courts. However, it is necessary to look beyond company law and embed the idea of regulatory competition in a much broader and more general context of the political economy and the philosophy of regulatory competition. So in part, this is what I am doing. Besides, I acknowledge the limitations of the principle of contractual freedom when it comes to creating a paradigm shift in corporate governance and the governance of uh, stakeholders' interests, such as employees' interests. Another point is that uh, in an increasingly globalized and deeply interconnected world, I view state competition for the best laws as a possible means for state legislatures to reach the best legal solutions, which will impact our economy and societies. Competition is therefore related to the principle of Pareto um, optimality. However, I must point out two caveats. It is important to bear in mind that companies are incorporated for different purposes, even when the design of their contractual framework embedded in the respective organic documents follows very uh, similar patterns with respect to form and uh, substance. The differences between uh, corporations and business purposes may influence the demand side of the law and therefore competition among states to provide that law. Additionally, it is important to keep in mind that competing states have different market structures and socioeconomic and political standards, which requires a functional analysis of each state's law to understand whether law can be treated as a product or a commodity. After acknowledging these caveats, I explore if state competition can originate legislation that forces a political change on boardrooms, especially when investors whose profile and power have dramatically evolved through the years call for more contractual freedom at a systemic level that can trigger knowledge spillover, which is crucial for innovation. What is knowledge spillover? 
I use knowledge spillover um, to signify the intentional sharing of valuable information with a competitor through investor and employee mobility and activism. Ronald Gilson, a U.S. law professor, explored the effects of knowledge spillover and linked them to the successful development of California's legal infrastructure. Gilson argued that the unenforceability of non-compete clauses in California was partly responsible for the development of Silicon Valley because it encouraged employees to change and share their knowledge and expertise with the new employer. The issues regarding NDAs used by the technology companies uh, that the Financial Times uh, reported reverberate reverberate the non-competition non agreements that Gilson talks about and that are not enforceable in California. Gilson's hypothesis of infrastructural development hints a fortiori that NDAs are unattractive and off-putting to employees and prevent organizational growth because they are restricted. NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, toward competition and can potentially hinder a knowledge spillover effect would likely contribute to the development and investment in the company. As I said earlier, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission in the United States, has followed this understanding regarding non-competes. The concept of knowledge spillover as a trigger of the market's evolutionary dynamics, economic aggregation, innovation, and growth provides the normative frame within which I investigate possible incentives for individual states to change their legislative and policy agenda and influence those at the C-suite and boards of directors regarding decisions that impact uh, employees. Understanding the market's evolutionary and competitive dynamics requires an inquiry into how different states product and how law can influence the economy and society. So basically, we need to understand how state competition works. In my case, I am interested in two market structures, the United States and the European Union. Before we talk about state competition in uh, the United States, we need to talk about the internal affairs doctrine, which fundamentally informs the market for corporate law. This doctrine allows corporations to choose um, uh, the jurisdiction where they wish to incorporate and consequently the corporate law that will govern them. Given the power of corporations to select the jurisdiction where they wish to incorporate and consequently the corporate law that will govern, um, state corporate law creates a form of state competition that enhances the economic position of the states that favor the demand side of corporate law. In the United States, Roberta Romano discussed the merits of jurisdictional competition in her path-breaking 1985 article, Law as a Product, Some Pieces of the Incorporation uh, Puzzle. So in her article, she provides empirical evidence to explain um, why uh, most corporations in the United States choose Delaware to incorporate. I want you to know that when it comes to the market for incorporation, um, Delaware occupies a position of dominance. The question is why and what does that entail? In the U.S., there were two sides in the state competition debate. One side called for more regulation at the federal level, for they considered that state competition for corporate charters would lead to a race for the bottom. They understood that increased state competition 
catered to managerial interests over shareholders' interests, which was detrimental to shareholders' welfare. It was inefficient and created permissive laws, the worst laws. The other side considered that state competition was efficient or would lead to efficient outcomes. In their view, there was no need for additional market regulation because competition for corporate charters would lead to the most optimal rules. Opposite, both sides used the same assumption. That assumption was that legislatures' desire to maximize revenues caused uh, state uh, um, uh, caused uh, state competition in a decentralized system of state corporation laws. However, there was scarce empirical evidence to support either of the contending sides. Romano comes into the debate to empirically explain that it is easier to incorporate in Delaware because of its favorable tax policies. Still, she continues to approach state competition in the US based on considerations of economic efficiency. So Romano speaks law as a product, still puts a great amount of emphasis on a corporate law's demand side, which some authors say reflects the, uh, uh, the corporate decision makers' uh, uh, adherence to uh, shareholder uh, primacy. However, in my paper, I am fundamentally thinking about other types of stakeholders, the employees. So, can we broaden the assumptions that drove the models for state competition to generate better policies that cater not only to the interests of shareholders, but also consider employees' interests? Can we create new uh, models uh, of state competition in the U.S. that pressure uh, uh, boards not to uh, impose contracts with restrictive clauses, such as NDAs, non-disclosure agreements that harm employees' mobility and access to the market? I say yes. However, for that to happen, we need a comparative, a comparative analysis. So what is a comparative analysis? The use of the comparative method has a long tradition in Europe. Given its colonial heritage, comparative law studies have shifted from Western-centered to a global perspective. One approach to comparative law, the functional method, has been severely criticized. The functional method focuses on uh, highlighting similarities between uh, legal systems. It uh, has been heavily criticized because systems are also different and those differences must be acknowledged and cherished. Despite the criticism um, uh, of the functional method, uh, Conrad Zweigertz and Hein Kotz's acclaimed book, An Introduction to Comparative Law, elevated those authors to the status of founders of the functional method. The functional method became significant uh, because European policymakers have resorted to the functional method to compare legal systems and to design the legislative framework for market integration in Europe. Now, there is a tension between uh, Romano's law as a product approach based on an idea of market integration, openness through uh, economic efficiency in the United States, and Zweigert's and Kotz functional approach that looks at how uh, similar countries' laws are and which has been used to pursue market integration through law in Europe. Integration through law um, is under pressure, not only in Europe, but also in the U.S., 
And that pressure has been inflamed by euroscepticism in Europe and populist movements in Europe and the US. The law has been politicized in a world that is increasingly polarized. As a reminder, I am talking about the comparative method because I want to extend the models of state competition or jurisdiction competition there exists in the U.S. And using the comparative method seems to be a normative way to review those models. So what is the best methodology? Um, if um, my proposal is to nurture free competition, where employees um, are not restricted by non-disclosure agreements uh, or other prohibitions to uh, exit an organization and access the market, what is the best methodology that policymakers should follow? Should they follow a methodology uh, that stimulates market integration or a market openness based on a mere efficiency considerations? Or should policy makers promote market integration or openness through law? This takes me to my concern that I shared with you initially, which was to understand what's the role of the market and what's the role of the law in facilitating all market participants' freedom to move and establish themselves is the best methodology to create an integrative market. And by an integrative market, I mean a market that generates competition, knowledge spillover, and innovation. It is the best methodology to generate such a market, the comparative method prevalent in the EU and proposed by authors like Zweigert and Kutz? Or is the best methodology um, an economic methodology, uh, including principles underlying economic reasoning, such as efficiency, more dominant in the U.S., as Romano's paper uh, demonstrates? In my paper, I, I argue that both approaches can complement themselves or even cannibalize themselves to create a new model of state competition for knowledge spillover and consequent innovation. In Europe, the internal market and freedoms of movement, such as free movement of goods, uh, capital, people, and freedom to establish and provide services were essentially created by law, by the uh, European Commission and the judgments of the European Court of Justice, uh, um, ECJ. However, there is not a lot of state competition in Europe because there is not a member state that plays the role of Delaware. So again, there is not a lot of state competition in Europe because there isn't Delaware. There is Luxembourg, but it's not the same as Delaware. In that case, when more state competition is needed for policy changes, I suggest the creation of a network of lawyers, advocates, market participants, and other gatekeepers to push for policy change that favors continued market openness and innovation capable of influencing corporate boards. Now, keeping an eye on the U.S. market, I use comparative law to suggest that more market integration, market openness in the US is needed. That would imply a new approach to state competition in the US to tell a story about why states can or should compete that goes beyond shareholder primacy and managerial power assumptions or mere considerations of economic effic efficiency to consider new global developments that give policymakers the opportunity to think about the ways the U.S. market can use tools to overcome transaction costs in the organizational setting. Now, I noticed that my preliminary conclusions were coming up, and it is time to talk about them. In sum, to understand 
the role of law and markets in creating knowledge spillover and innovation that influence corporate settings, I came up with a research question. How can state competition create new enforceable legal solutions for the high transaction costs deriving from the contractual governance of corporations and the management of other interests besides shareholders' interests? The answer is state competition can create new enforceable legal solutions for the high transaction costs deriving from contractual governance of corporations and the management of other interests besides shareholders' interests through law designed for that purpose. The law should contemplate all stakeholders' interests, not just shareholders. When the institutional context does not allow for more competition, knowledge spillover, and innovation, then competition, knowledge spillover, and innovation should be triggered by a network of gatekeepers. This tells us that the roles of the law and markets are intertwined and that you as lawyers play a relevant, challenging, and rewarding part in this whole process toward socioeconomic development. Now, I would like to briefly tell you about the elements of the paper. To reach my preliminary conclusions, I used the comparative method. Additionally, I used uh, terminology and concepts that pertain to other fields of law, such as constitutional law, which helps find a common denominator for EU and US markets in terms of values, principles, and proportionality of restrictions on market access set forth in the law. I also used international and political science terminology to explain the concept of development and how it can be institutionally construed. Finally, I used concepts of economic theory, such as economic efficiency, to integrate the uh, discussion I presented into a more general philosophy of jurisdiction jurisdictional competition or state competition. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. I am, of course, open to your questions. Thank you. Well, um, thank you very much, Lacey. We just gave you a, a round of applause if it, if it wasn't <laughs> if it wasn't on the mic.